Welcome back, everybody. Now, we've been talking about the idea of the avant-garde, these progressive artists and art movements in Europe since the 1890s, for example. But it's not until after the turn of the 20th century when we can really talk about an American avant-garde. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to be talking about three sort of broad movements. The Ashcan School, we're going to talk about the artists who gathered around Alfred Stieglitz and Gallery 291. And finally, we're going to talk about precisionism as the first sort of American born progressive sort of modern art movement. Now, the truth is, you know, there's a distance between Europe and America. So American artists, although increasingly they traveled to Paris or Berlin at the turn of the century, very often artists had to rely on sort of secondhand information about the artists and art movements that were going on abroad, either through things like reproductions and magazines or descriptions. Um, and this is how they learned about what was going on. Uh, but increasingly, there's going to be greater exposure of America to some of these avant-garde art movements. We've already talked about the 1913 Armory Show, which is going to be pivotal for the American avant-garde. And not only that, but we've increasingly seen American collectors. We talked about Leo and Gertrude Stein, for example, and there were other collectors as well who were not only bringing works home from Europe, but also spurring on artistic production here as well. So today we're going to look at these three separate art movements, beginning with the Ashcan School. Now, in some ways, in talking about the Ashcan School, we're going to feel like you're moving a little bit back in time, more towards an art that looks a little bit like realism, sort of the mid 19th century in European art. But this was sort of the first moment in American art where we really see the same sort of purposeful rebelliousness against the academy that we've been talking about in the late 19th century in Europe. And it begins with the Ashcan School and particularly an artist named Robert Henry. And Henry is um, born in Cincinnati and his family lived like sort of in this wild west world of homesteaders and then there was some sort of event where his father shot somebody and they had got driven off their land there was some sort of scandal until he ends up um, back in the sort of you know east coast area he's in philadelphia where he goes to school he goes to the um, pennsylvania academy of fine arts from 1886 to 1888 um, and he settles then in new york and also in new jersey in atlantic city so we have a local artist um, he was a member of the academy you know we've talked about this idea of the academy and the academy is all about the sort of adherence to tradition the masterpiece pupil relationship, the interest in the artwork of the past. And this is something that originally Henry is a part of. He's a member of the Academy, but eventually he has conflicts with his colleagues and he begins to become openly hostile to the Academy and the idea of a rigid jury system and the idea that artists had to paint what they had to paint rather than the subjects that they chose. Now, the time for the Ashcan School was sort of right, um, really only about 10 years before these artists emerge in the first decade of the 20th century is when we get the writings of sort of Mark Twain and this idea of realism in literature. So this really is a part um, of the same thing. And Henry decides to start his own independent art school, and he becomes one of the most um, important teachers of art at the very beginning of the 20th century. So what is Ashcan? Now, first of all, it is not a sort of organized art school. We consider them all sort of what we call urban realists. And they sort of all follow this model motto that we talk about for Robert Henry, which is art for life's sake rather than art for art's sake. So it's a realist tradition, mostly organized before, before um, World War I. So they exhibited together in 1904. Then in 1908, there was a landmark exhibition that featured many of the Ashcan artists that was called The Eight. Um, they exhibited at the um, Exhibition of Independent Artists in 1910, and they exhibited at the Armory Show in 1913. So those are the years that they're most 
sort of active between about 1904 and 1913. So like I said, it's not an organized movement. So what are the characteristics of the period? Well, first of all, like the realists, they chose everyday subjects and they preferred sort of the seedy aspects of urban life. They liked to paint the sort of industrializing city um, and they painted it in a very straightforward way that was shocking sort of to the artists who were part of the academy. Um, they um, kept an eye on sort of current events and social and political ideas, but they were not real social critics or reformers, you know, so it's not as if they are socialist radicalist radicals in many cases, they sort of lived comfortable middle class lives. They just like to paint the urban poor. In terms of their style, you're going to see what almost looks like a realist tending towards impressionist kind of very broad, quick brushstroke um, that sort of references the past. Um, one quote that I liked about them is that they were less inclined to paint the skyscrapers than the people who built it. They like to look at the particular rather than the universal. So that's what we're going to look at with Henry. So very interesting artist and art movement. Um, Henry, by the way, called the Academy the a cemetery of art and the Ashcan School was in turn um, called the Apostles of Art ugliness. So we're just going to look at three artists associated with Ashcan, um, which by the way is a title that didn't get applied to them until like the 1930s and I think it was sort of a reference to the ubiquitous urban garbage can, but I also heard that it may have had something to do um, with a print that was published by an artist named George Bellows that we'll look at um, in 1915. But it was a title that was sort of retroactively applied to them, but it gives you this sense of the gritty realism we're going to associate with their style. So we're going to look at one work by three different artists. We'll look at Robert Henry, we'll look at a work by John Sloan, and we'll look at a painting by a sort of second generation Ashcan school, a little bit later. Um, George Bellows. Now we'll start with this work by Robert Henry, and it's a work called Salome, which is a subject that should ring a bell with you because we've seen a similar subject before when we looked at Gustave Moreau's The Apparition, the symbolist painter from 1876. Now this painting is the painting of Salome, which is the daughter of King Herod, the one who requests for and gets the head of St. John the Baptist. And here she is as a dancer preparing to dance the dance of the seven Fails. Now the story though behind this is actually quite interesting. Robert Henry, in order to paint this, hired a professional dancer, her name was Mademoiselle Vokleska, to pose as Salome. And he tries to exhibit the work at the National Academy of Design in the spring exhibition of 1909, but it was rejected. And that was really kind of severe because, um, as we saw, Robert Henry was part of the Academy. And as I mentioned, he bonked heads with them, but they rejected the work. Um, and he ended up showing it in 1910 at the Independent Artists Exhibition, where it shocked people because it was her very direct gaze, the sort of eroticism, the confrontational nature of it. Um, and at the time that it was shown, one critic said, called it a vivid perpetuation of a moment hardly worth eternalizing on this scale. You'll notice it's quite a large work. Now, as I tell you this, it should remind you of something, which really is Edward Manet's Olympia, way back from 1863, the first class when we were talking about realism. And this has a lot in common with Manet's picture. First of all, because it sort of is overtly sensual, but it has these references to the past. So Henry's picture is referencing this biblical narrative, but is also made um, sort of sexualized and sensualized. And the truth of the matter was that like Manet, he was taking sort of 
a classical idea and bringing it to a modern world. So Manet looks at the tradition of the reclining Venus and turns her into a prostitute. Robert Henry was painting the biblical Salome, but he also wasn't really painting the biblical Salome. He was painting contemporary dancers. So apparently, um, there were Salome dancers performing in New York City, which was sort of a risque, sort of burlesque like dance. You know, in other words, you could have these clubs where people go to watch dancers and it's a little bit racy. And some critics called it the Salome ap epidemic because it was this excuse for this vulgar, sort of provocative dancing. And so when he paints Salome, it's less that he's painting Salome, the biblical figure. Instead, he's painting this modern world. And so you see this sort of mix between what is art and what is vulgar, what is um, you know, worthy of being in a museum, what's a subject of sort of theater. And we saw similar ideas looking at that even with post-impressionism. So on the one hand, it's got these sort of high tastes because it's this biblical subject. And then it also has the sort of reference to low culture, which is what we saw with Manet's Olympia. And by the way, like Manet's pictures of both um, the Olympia and the Dejeuner sur l'herbe, they were also shocking because of that very overt gaze, which is something that um, Mademoiselle Vokleska shares. Um, also, she's painted on a very large scale, which was something that was shocking about the realist paintings of the, you know, mid 19th century. And it's got that very sort of broad, quick brushwork. So the style too sort of looks back on the 19th century traditions. But with this picture, Henry sort of sets the stage for this painting of modern urban life. Um, that the Ashcan School is going to be known for, though we're going to see two other artists treat it in slightly different ways. So now we'll take a look at the works of John Sloan, who is another sort of these early sort of founding members of the Ashcan School. He was also a member that uh, participated in that exhibition called The Eight. Um, by training, he really focused early on in his career with etching and printmaking. He actually worked as an illustrator for the Philadelphia Inquirer, and quite a few of the Ashcan artists had this background in sort of what we would call the graphic arts as opposed to painting. And he's from Pennsylvania, and so he ended up studying at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in 1892, and that's where he ran into Henry. And Henry not only encouraged his sort of interest in the graphic arts, but also encouraged him to try his hand at painting. And he ended up moving to New York City, where he got a studio in Chelsea, and he began to participate in the New York art scene. So he actually participated in the Armory Show in 1913, and he was even a member of the organizing committee. So Sloan plays an important role in bringing modernism, um, sort of European tradition of modernism to America. Now, I'm going to go against something I just said, which was that even though these artists focused on scenes of sort of the urban environment and even scenes of the urban poor, that they generally were not political. And that is not actually true of John Sloan insofar as he did join the Socialist Party. Um, he did talk about this work in particular, and he said that this work was, quote, the only picture with an element of propaganda made after I joined the party, and I felt uncomfortable while painting it. Um, Sloan kept a diary, um, and he gives us some insight into this subject, which is called Recruiting in Union Square. So what we're looking at is a scene of things that he would have seen all the time, which were um, recruits, people recruiting for the armed services. And so here you can see a soldier sort of on the central axis, very sort of sharply dressed with the black hat and the white gloves, talking to a potential recruit, which is the man that we see um, in this brown outfit here. Um, we see in the brown outfit with the sort of soft cap and he has his hands behind his back um, and behind his back, he holds a wrench. So he is identifiable as a laborer. So we're seeing a scene of recruitment. Um, 
And this is actually a scene that John Sloan saw in Madison Square. So uh, he actually changed the name of the location in the picture. But he wrote about the picture while he was um, well, while he was formulating the idea for it when he was um, writing in his diary. And he said this, and this was on May 10th, 1909. He was describing how he loafed about Madison Square, where the trees are heavily daubed with fresh green and the benches filled with tired bums near the fountain is a U.S. Army recruiting sign. Two samples of our military are in attendance, but the bums stick to the freedom of their poverty. There's a picture in this, a drawing or an etching probably. And then three days later, he mar remarked in his diary that he painted in the afternoon, started a city square with recruiting service sign displayed among the bench warmers. So we know exactly when he began this picture and what the subject was supposed to be. So he arranges the picture on this sort of central sort of diagonal axis. Um, you can find the line of the axis from the women in the background and it moves diagonally through the men who meet in the center and then through the two boys and their dog in the foreground who were looking at a recruitment poster. So, you know, in some sense, those boys standing, standing for us in the picture, they're standing with their back towards us looking in and they're actually looking at a picture the way we're looking at a picture. Um, but you again, you could see this sort of diagonal axis moving into space. And then we see the people that, um, is being described by Sloan as the bums, um, which are all of these men mostly that we see seated on park benches. There's a few female figures interspersed, but mostly male figures shoved shoulder to shoulder and they wear this sort of same dark muddy brown colors that we see the potential recruit um, wearing on the central axis. So it's got this sort of political meaning to it. Um, first of all, this idea, you know, the children are looking at the poster and then there's this idea that, you know, they indoctrinate children young into military service. Um, and people have remarked at the, at the time, people remarked at the effectiveness of sort of these sort of garish posters at bringing people into the service. And this sort of political content is something that Sloan wrote about as well in his diary. And he said, why should the workers fight each other in order to preserve or expand or destroy the trade relations in which they have no real interest? And in another place he wrote, workers to kill the workers, the capital may hold its upper hand. So the subject does appear to be political, but again, from the point of view of the Ashcan school, this was important simply because he was painting the realities of sort of this urban world, not only what would be the impending World War I, but also the sort of unemployed men presumably who are sitting on these park benches in the middle of the day and they become sort of a prime place to gather recruits from. Um, and also the fact that it's painting the city scene from this sort of urban everyman point of view. You can also see that very, very quick brush stroke, the flattening of the pictorial space, despite the fact of that diagonal that moves into the picture. It's all heavy brushwork. The style is very much of the style that we got used to looking not only at the realist painters, but also at the impressionists that followed. Now, what turned out to be one of the most famous artists of the Ashcan School is actually a slightly later addition, which is a painter named George Bellows, who was born and raised in Columbus, Ohio. And he was an athlete from the time of his youth, quite gifted. And he played basketball and baseball. I thought he, I think he played baseball sort of in a semi-pro level. And then he ends up relocating to New York eventually to study art, where he becomes a disciple of Robert Henry. So he becomes one of his students and then becomes one of the most famous and accomplished painters of Ashcan. And his interest in sports is something that spills over into his paintings. And he ultimately becomes um, quite famous making these works. And then he dies at a young age, I think at 42, from um, the uh, after effects of a ruptured appendix. So this picture is one of his most famous, which is called Stag at Sharkies. 
And it depicts, obviously, a boxing match, except that boxing matches for money where people were watching and in attendance was illegal at the time. So this falls into that category of sort of the seedy underside of urban life. So right across from Bellows Studio in New York was a um, place called Sharky's Athletic Club, which was really a saloon. It was like a bar, but they had a back room where they had a boxing club. Um, and this is because boxing was illegal. There was sort of a way around it, which was that you could have spectators watching a fight they couldn't pay to watch but they could be members of a club and so these boxing clubs um, emerged and now usually these fights were between members of the club however if you had somebody who wasn't a member of the club who was going to participate in a fight you would give them temporary membership and they were known as a stag so that is why we get the title that we get the stag at sharkies um, boxing at the time, you know, some people thought of it as being completely barbaric, but it also had a different attitude was sort of look, you know, was sort of put on it. Um, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, the president, thought it was this expression of sort of healthy manliness. Um, and, you know, you can look at it as sort of survival of the fittest kind of idea that's sort of appropriate to modern society. But Bellows really had not much to say about this. He said reportedly, I don't know anything about boxing. I'm just painting two men trying to kill each other. And so this is a scene that's painted of a fight like this, presumably from memory. It is a very dynamic composition. And we talk about compositions as being dynamic. We look for things like diagonal lines. And you'll notice in Bellow's picture, we get this very strong diagonal formed by the boxer on the left with his leg fully extended. And then that's balanced on the right hand side by the downcast diagonal arm of the referee in the back. So it's this very sort of geometric composition with this pyramid in the center and this grid created by the horizontal lines of the ropes and of the rain, the, the sort of mat they're on and also the, the vertical lines of the post. So it's this very sort of classical organized composition despite the subject which is very dynamic and violent. It's kind of interesting because Bellows is painting a subject that has a great tradition in the history of art and Bellows was appreciated both by um, sort of followers of the avant-garde and the Ashcan school, but also by academic artists. And it's interesting because boxing has a history in um, the tradition of art. So ancient Greek artists made images of athletes and even boxers. And this is a very famous bronze statue from the sort of late or Hellenistic Greek period. You can see this boxer with his, you know, hands gloved and he's got a broken nose and a busted up ear. And, you know, so, so this is kind of subject referred back to classical tradition, even if it did something in an entirely new way. So the picture is painted with all of the characteristics of Ashcan, the idea that it's got this sort of gritty, violence, masculine view of the city. It's got this really rough, quick, broad brushstroke, this very dull palette, um, you know, which gives us again this sense that we're in this sort of smoky, dark environment. In fact, um, you'll notice that you know, we're meant to feel like we're part of the scene, you know, this it feels very, we're very close to it because we're only just really looking over the shoulders of the people looking into the scene. You notice the boxers are anonymous. We don't see their faces, nor do we see the face of the referee, but we can see the faces of some of the spectators who are like us. And in fact, one of the spectators um, is actually the painter himself, and that is Bellow's bald head. He sort of has his head tipped down and just his eyes looking up as if he's making a drawing, perhaps, on his lap. So he shows himself as a spectator like us, but also shows him in the act of recording. And this picture up close is wonderful because you can see the technique that Bellows is using, how this is that guy's leg. It's just these really thick, 
um, strokes of impastoed paint. You can see the very, very quick brushwork. He's not working with underdrawing and preparatory drawing. He's applying paint right onto the surface, wet on wet, and blending it there. So it's as quickly painted as it looks, which also helps to capture that dynamic feeling like it's a like it's a still frame work in motion. I love by the way that it's called stags, the the people who were these temporary boxers because the two men in the middle of this fight look like actual stags, like the animal locked in combat. Now, the work was quite famous, and Bellows, like a lot of, as I mentioned, a lot of the Ashcan artists actually also made prints as well. And so Bellows made a version of this as a lithograph some years later. It's not a copy, um, but it's another version. So he makes the original painting in 1909, and eight years later, because it was so popular, um, he made a lithograph of it, because why not? Lithographs were reproducible, and it meant that he could make more money. So he started making lithographs around 1916, and he made images about, you know, the human condition and tragedy in World War I. But here he is sort of bringing back his most famous picture at that time. Um, and it's interesting because, as I said, you could see it's not a copy. Um, there are marked differences about each of them, but it also shows you that he thinks about each work differently depending on its medium. Um, he Prints are more intimate. You hold a print in your hands. And so you can see that he makes it feel more intimate. Um, he has on the right hand side, you notice some of the figures turn around to face us. We see more of the figures of the spectators. We can actually identify some of their professions by the clothes that they wear. So it's meant to feel very um, immediate. You'll also notice he's eliminated the ropes across the front of the boxers, which also makes us feel more and more like we are um, a part of the scene. By the way, in these cases, as well as the painting, the people in the audience watching seem as sort of violent and raucous as the boxers themselves. So he ended up making um, this lithograph, which we've learned about lithography before, all right, which is a printmaking, a planographic printmaking technique where you work with a grease crayon on a polished stone. Um, he made about not, he made 99 impressions of his first run of this and they all sold out. So it shows you the popularity of these artists. So even their bucking tradition, they were bucking what was going on in the academy. They were feeding this need and people were interested in Ashcan as a sort of early avant-garde movement. Now the next group of artists I want to look at really don't have a name. So I'm just calling them the American avant-garde, which I suppose we could say that about um, the Ashcan school because they were really the only artists, you know, before 1910 in America who had some real success in challenging the academy. And again, what we mean by challenging the academy, the academy is an institution, but it's also really, we could think of the academy as sort of an idea of how painters were supposed to work. The academy focused on the study of the human figure as the primary focus of the visual arts. It emphasized the importance of drawing as the basis for art rather than color, and it emphasized um, looking at the art of the past. And so there were only a few groups of artists that bucked that tradition. And the Academy, by the way, um, really controlled the art market as well, and what art got exhibited and what art, mar like art got sold. So the next group that comes along to do this comes along at Gallery 291 or 291 Gallery, um, and with the photographer Alfred Stieglitz. So we're going to talk about Stieglitz as a photographer separately, but right now we're going to talk about his role in giving a voice to the American avant-garde painters. So he is a local boy. He is born in Hoboken, New Jersey. And his parents were German Jewish ancestry. And in fact, when he's a teenager, his father decided he wanted his 
children to have sort of a European sort of broad based education. So as a teen, he ended up moving to Germany with his family and he spent nine years there, which he thoroughly enjoyed. Germany, as we saw, was a real center for modernism in the arts at exactly this time. But he starts learning photography and he plans, he comes back to New York with the plan that he was going to be a, uh, have a, a career in photo engraving, you know, like a good, honest sort of business career. But he becomes increasingly interested in photography. And in 1902, he forms a group called the Photo Secession. And it really had kind of the same purpose in a way as the Ashcan School, but for photographers. He was the self-appointed leader of this group, and they were a group of um, photographers who were interested, interested in separating from tradition. They were interested in what was new and what was experimental and what was modern. And they sort of succeeded from the tradition of photography. Um, from what they said was the accepted idea of what constitutes a photograph. So we're going to look at his work. He, he works with um, Edward Steichen, and we'll talk about that as well. Um, but he creates this photo secession group, and then he ends up creating an art gallery, which originally was called the Little Galleries of the Photo Secession. And it was at 291 Fifth Avenue, and they began to do photography exhibitions in 1905. And um, Stieglitz also created um, a magazine um, called Camera Work, where he published avant-garde sort of photography. Um, but increasingly, by the time we get to 1907, he decides to show at the gallery art that was not only photography, but rather also painting. Now, he loses his lease, um, and then in 1908, he gets the gallery next door. And instead of calling it the Little Galleries of the Photo Secession, he just calls it um, the 291 Gallery. And by a few years after this, it becomes the most important center for avant-garde art, not just in America, but maybe in the world. Um, he not only showed at the gallery all sorts of work by European modernists. So he's showing the works of Rodin and Matisse and the post-impressionists, um, but he's also showing the American avant-garde as well. And so 291 becomes this sort of meeting place where sort of American pioneers of this kind of modernism begin to assemble. And it becomes a center place for New York Dada, which we also saw as well. So Stieglitz becomes incredibly important because he brings together this group of modernists around him. So the gallery ran the and in this iteration, um, Gallery 290 or 291 Gallery ran from 1908 to 1917, and then it closed. But he continued to hold ex sponsor exhibitions and find, you know, sort of promote the exhibition of important contemporary avant garde American painters. Um, but then he opened up another gallery called the Intimate Gallery in 1925. And then a gallery called An American Place in 1929, which he actually directed until his death. So he is incredibly important, along with the Armory Show in 1913. It was really the 291 Gallery that was the only other really sort of um, jumping off point for the American avant-garde. Now, one of the artists very much associated with this Stieglitz circle and the 291 gallery would be John Marin, who is primarily known as a watercolor painter. So, you know, this is an artist who, instead of taking his pigments and mixing them with oil, right, which is what oil paint is, he's working in pigments dissolved in water, which has very different kinds of properties. Um, he is, by the way, a local boy born in Rutherford, New Jersey, but he studies in Philadelphia and New York, but not art. Um, he actually ends up going to Europe between 1905 and 1910. And while he's in Europe in 1909, he comes across Alfred Stieglitz and they form a very close relationship. And Stieglitz actually eventually um, guarantees him an income 
um, so he could study painting and until his paintings begin to sell, and then offers him a one-man exhibition almost every year. So this is one of Stieglitz's close protégés. So he really receives no formal training as an artist till he is 28 years old. Um, he studies in Paris a little bit when he's 35, but it's really not until he's about 40 years old where he's functioning as a professional artist, which is really kind of remarkable. But he did have his first one-man show at 291 in 1910. Um, and again, watercolor is his preferred medium. And you can see how he takes advantage of it. You know, that watercolor gives, it has this very sort of loose, informal sense. You can see the sort of quick way he applies the paint. And he, so he's taking advantage of what the medium has to offer. So I'm showing you two of his early works from 1911 and 1912. Um, on the right, you see 1911's from the window of 291 looking down Fifth Avenue. And on the left, you can see Brooklyn Bridge. So these are watercolor works with a little bit of graphite or charcoal um, on paper. But even though it's interesting because both of these works, you can still see um, tradition behind it. They're, they're sort of perspectival scenes, these three-dimensional city views, but he's eliminated most of the line that would come from charcoal or graphite. And instead, it really becomes um, the kind of work that is expressing itself almost exclusively through color. Um, it, he trained, by the way, his earliest works were landscapes. Um, but in the city, he focuses this attention on cityscapes and viewing the parts of the cities with which he was most familiar. And that's something we saw the Ashcan painters doing as well. Um, he wrote about his New York watercolors in camera work, which was Stieglitz photography magazine. And he said this, shall we consider the life of a great city as confined simply to the people and the animals on its streets and in its buildings? Are the buildings themselves dead? I see great forces at work, great movements, the large buildings and the small buildings, the warring of the great and the small, influences of one mass on another, greater or smaller mass. Feelings are aroused which give me the desire to express the reaction of these pull forces, those influences which play with one another, great masses pulling smaller masses, each subject in some degree to the other's power. While these powers are at work pushing, pulling, sideways, downwards, upwards, I can hear the sound of their strife, and there's great music being played. And so I try to express graphically what a great city is doing. Within the frames there must be a balance, a controlling of these warring, pushing, pulling forces. So here we see him doing kind of like what we saw the Ashcan painters do, but rather than the focus being on the people, um, the focus is on this m bustling force, this movement dynamic nature of the city itself. You can see the development of these ideas in a slightly later watercolor from the next decade, which is his Lower Manhattan composition derived from the top of Woolworth Building, which similarly shows a very specific view of the city, but rather now than being more descriptive, the way we could recognize the Brooklyn Bridge, for example, um, you can see the picture becoming more expressive and more abstract. Um, where we really just can sense, sense the, the speed and the clamor and the vibrations of the modern city rather than see something carefully described. When we look at it, though, we still can make out the forms of what look like roads or alleys and buildings. Um, the watercolor is more densely applied. It's more rapidly applied. You see these big broad areas of dark patches of color and then you see some areas of paler wash as well but it really all is about this movement that we heard Marin describe when he talked about the city the idea that it's almost music being played um, at the very center of the work is a very interesting element which is this round shape which honestly looks a lot like um, a dome from a different perspective. But what you're looking at in the middle of it is a yellow starburst. That's actually a paper cutout. 
So if you look at the description of the medium, it's watercolor and charcoal. So we can see the watercolor in the color. And he's using the charcoal much more aggressively than he did in his first two watercolors. So we have these very bold lines. And then it says paper cutout. And so that is that starburst is a paper cutout that's actually then sewn onto the paper. And it is a reference to the decoration that was found um, on a particular building, the World Building, which was in Lower Manhattan, and had these starburst decorations, and it had this golden sort of dome on the top. So there are references to landmark, but they're treated um, in a less descriptive way, right? And so instead, it just becomes all energy. Another important artist of Stieglitz's circle, and a very interesting artist, is Arthur G. Dove, um, who, like Marin had a sort of background in illustration. So he was an illustrator by profession um, until he abandoned his career and he went to Paris in 1907 with these hopes that he was going to be um, a, pa a painter. And so he studied the works of European modernism. And when he came back to New York in 1912, he exhibited his works at 291 Gallery. So again, he's of this very same circle. Um, this is one of his most important works. He did a series of pictures which he called um, his Ten Commandments. Um, and they were a series of ten pictures, which were abstract pictures made out of the medium of pastel, which were meant to be sort of his spiritual and artistic credo. Like this was his statement as an artist. So there were ten of these. They are pastel, and we've seen pastels before. If you think back to Degas, this means he's working with sticks of um, powdered pigments. You get these very, as you can see, intense, bright colors on the surface and uh, it's a very intimate medium because you sort of really work with your hands um, so it's a very intimate sort of work um, and it this one is one of these Ten Commandments and it is called sales that was personally important for Dove um, Dove actually lived on he always lived on the waters so he grew up at Seneca Lake which is one of the New York Finger Lakes sort of area. He was an, an outdoorsman. And actually, 10 years after he paints this, in 1922, he ends up buying this big sailboat and he basically lives on it um, and has his studio on it. So both him and his, um, well, later, who would be his wife, an artist named Helen Tor, be his second wife. Um, so he actually would live on a sailboat and paint from a sailboat. And that really seems to be the perspective of the picture that we're looking at here. So this is an interesting work because on the one hand, this is ridiculously progressive. When his Ten Commandments were exhibited at 291 and then they were also shown at a Chicago gallery, they caused like a serious stir because this was before the 1913 Armory Show. And abstract art of this kind really hadn't been seen in America. And honestly, um, we think of Kandinsky as really being at the forefront of making works that are non-objective, sort of no reference to the outside world. Um, contemporary works, Dove's like a step ahead of Kandinsky in terms of making works that are sort of pure form, pure geometric abstraction. So this was really important and really radical. On the other hand, we still do. He's still hanging on the way early Kandinsky is. He's hanging on to these references to the world. And so we see these images of sailboats. We can see the sails. We can make out something of a horizon. But we feel almost like we could see into the distance, like there's a little bit of this reference to three-dimensional space and pictures because there's overlap and it looks like the forms are sort of receding. But it also feels like we're in the boat and the boat is moving. And so the forms are sort of fractured and ruptured and we can see us being tossed by the waves. So it's like he's using um, the natural world as his inspiration. But what we're really looking at is his subjective sort of response to it. 
Um, but it's all set into this motion, it's dynamic, but everything is reduced to its simplest geometric form, which is what gets us so close to abstraction. So this was revolutionary, his Ten Commandments, um, and it shows you just how important Stieglitz Gallery was in showing things to people that they hadn't yet seen. Now, Dove did more than painting. Um, he actually was relatively a pioneer of objects that were known as assemblages. Um, and so between 1924 and 1930, he produced about 25 of these multimedia assemblages. So an assemblage, we talked about the ready-made, the idea that you can take an object and you can, like, like Duchamp did with the fountain, and turn it into art by changing its meaning. An assemblage is taking ready-made objects and assembling them. So this is a conglomeration of different kinds of objects arranged. So it has a relationship to the ready-made, it has a relationship to collage. So very modern in terms of its ideas. Um, and this here we see it's an assemblage of bamboo. So you can see the bamboo sticks, um, denim shirt sleeves, buttons, wood, which you can see um, in this large block um, at the bottom towards the right, um, and oil on wood, so oil paint on this wood support. So this is one of Dove's assemblages, and, you know, it's a problematic work, and we can talk about it, because it is interesting. Formally, it's very interesting, because again, it shows he's aware of Cubist collage, but it also shows something that feels distinctly American. Um, in the 1920s, there was a revived interest in American folk art, and folk artists like to incorporate objects in their world, into their works. Um, so this has an element of folk art in it as much as it does modernism. So even as I said, I mentioned Duchamp as a sort of inspiration, this has none of the sort of subversive nature of Dada, but it shows you the way that Dove is pulling together all of these different um, influences into this work. Now, okay, that's the really interesting part. Well, it gets trickier after that. Um, we could talk about the subject because this has been interpreted a number of different ways. So this was bought by an American, American collector um, pretty early on who originally said he was horrified by the work. And that's because there's been some debate about what the subject of the picture is. Um, according to Dove, it was a portrait of an African-American man sitting on a dock. Okay, so hence the title, Going Fishing. And so in this case, the bamboo become fishing poles and, you know, the denim becomes the clothing. And this chunk of wood, which becomes sort of three-dimensional and bows out of the picture is a part of the dock, supposedly. But according to Stieglitz, when he wrote about this picture, um, this picture was not just a man sitting on a dock. Um, he instead thought that the picture was about a drowned African-American fisherman, um, which had been written about in the news. Um, and that changes the meaning of the picture somewhat. By the way, other people just have looked at this work as related to, again, sort of Mark Twain interest in, um, sort of realistic depiction of American characters, um, you know, and this becomes just sort of a good natured fishing sort of exploits, but it's more complicated than that. So if this is in fact, and this is how the person who bought the picture interpreted it, it's how Stieglitz interpreted it, it was supposed to be a drowned African American man in the water whose body was discovered. Um, and I'll tell you something, the original title of this work, right through the 1940s, before the original owner died, um, had a racial epithet, a not good word, a racial slur before going fishing to identify the African-American man. So it's a complicated picture. Um, when we look at this dark, dark piece of wood, um, 
it's about if you look at these sleeves it's about where we would expect a shirt pocket maybe to be but the art and the artist sort of subverts that notion makes it complicated by gluing a button onto it but that also makes this sort of like a head like an eye um, in which case we can start to read the forms in the pictures almost anatomically um, so that these um, bamboo pieces become fingers with sort of fingernails at the tip and these become the forearm and then these become like another hand and we can see the two um, arms of the sleeve and maybe in the repetitive motion of these horizontals we can almost see the the if we see it as a fisher as a real being cast and we could see the bowing of these um, pieces of bamboo that are thin up at the top is maybe a fisherman um, who's you know trying to reel in a fish right so it's sort of bowing under the weight um, but it's problematic right in terms of how we read it it's ambiguous um, and, and we're not sure exactly how to read it. So you have to put that within the context of its time. Uh, what is really, really novel is that what he's trying to present here is truly this sort of portrait. It's supposed to be a real person in whatever state. And again, Dove himself said this was of a man sitting on a dock, but the anecdotal information suggests it might be something else. He may have changed his mind about his meaning. Um, but this was supposed to be really a portrait of a person being represented by assemblage, which is a really interesting and novel idea. Just like Dove's assemblage is an abstract portrait, we can also think about an abstract painted portrait in the same light. And this work is by Marsden Hartley, who's one of the most famous artists to come out of Stieglitz's circles. Um, he's born in Maine, um, and but he does spend quite a lot of time traveling, living in both Paris and Berlin. And in Berlin, he came under the influence of Jablauer Reiter. So he knew Mark. He was very influenced by Kandinsky. And he came to the attention of Stieglitz, um, who showed him at uh, 291 Gallery for the first time in 1909. Now, this is a little bit later. This is from a series of paintings that he makes between 1914 and 1915, which derived imagery from German flags, military symbols, and other sorts of imperial objects. They're meant to be collages, well, not collages, they're meant to be portraits of sort, um, but they reference a lot of other art movements that we've seen. So this is a work that certainly looks like it has a relationship to cubism, particularly synthetic cubism, where forms are being built up out of flattened sort of planar forms into abstract patterns, but it's got a sort of expressionistic treatment in terms of color and brushwork. The work is a portrait of Marsden Hartley's dear friend, a man named Carl von Freiburg, who was probably also his lover. Um, and this is an abstract portrait, as I said, in the way that Dove's portrait is abstract. Here, Hartley is represented not by physical likeness, but rather by symbols. And there are a lot of symbols here. Now, over, overwhelmingly, we have these images, as we said, of, you know, German military images. And so these works were not received very well when they were exhibited. Some of these um, German flag portraits were shown in 1916 at 291, and they were seen very much as being pro-German. Um, but it, that wasn't really the case. He was more interested in the sort of the pomp and pageantry of, of the German war effort rather than thinking about um, the devastation of the war. But it is a portrait of von Freiburg, and it's done in a very interesting way because he's using all sorts of symbols in the work to point to him. So there's certain things that are pretty easy to make out. For example, at the bottom left corner, we see KVF, so we see Karl von Freiburg's initials. Um, but then we see other things as well. 
we see the number 24 off to the side, which is um, von Freiburg's age at the time of his death. We see the number four um, in red on this blue ground, which um, looks like his uniform, and it stands for the fourth regiment of the Kaiser's Guard, which is where, in, which is the regiment in which von Freiburg fought. We can also see the E, and there's two of them. There's an E here and an E here as well, which probably refers to von Freiburg's regiment, which was the Bavarian Eisenbahn. Um, by the way, the Bavarian flag, that's represented by the blue and white checkers. We can see in the big triangle at the top, sort of almost occupying, if this were a traditional portrait, the place of a head, we can see the Iron Cross, which von Freiburg was awarded for bravery. The other incidental details which reference him are things like the checkerboard pattern, which were supposed to very specifically reference his love of chess. So this was a shockingly new kind of work when it was exhibited because it was completely abstract and you could see the way that in 1914 it's pulling on the tendencies and pulling from the tendencies of what kinds of work showed up at the 1913 armory show so with cubism being so new and german expressionism of that first generation being new you could see the influence on that in hartley's work but hear him turning it into something um, slightly different. But without a doubt, the most famous artist who came out of the Stieglitz circle was Georgia O'Keeffe, um, who's really become an iconic figure in American modernism. Um, she first met Stieglitz when she came to see a Hartley exhibition, that Hartley exhibition in 1916 when he showed his German officer portraits. Um, Hartley knew her. He said that she was modern by instinct, but we do know that she paid a lot of attention and studied um, the works of European modernists, especially through her association with 291, which began by 1916. And then in 1917, her very first solo exhibition was at 291. In fact, her first solo exhibition at 291 was the last show at um, Gallery 291 before 291 Gallery, before it was um, closed by Stieglitz. Um, she ended up having an affair with Stieglitz. Um, he photographed her more than 300 times. I'm showing you one of her photographs here. Um, he did marry her in 1924. And so they had a long and very interesting relationship together. Um, O'Keefe went on really to be one of the most influential artists of the early you know, 20th century working between New York City and New Mexico. Um, and she became known for her images, which have very sort of um, simplistic images, meaning there's a very, what we call an economy of detail. So not a lot of detail where she sort of simplifies works to very pure areas of form and shape and color almost to the point of the forms becoming abstract. Um, but when she paints abstract pictures, they almost appear to suggest nature. So it's this wonderful in-between place. So this is one of her early works and it's, and it's an abstraction. Um, the title tells us that. It's simply called um, Music, Pink and Blue, number two. Um, so there is a number one of this picture. This is a slightly later iteration of it. I'll tell you something interesting, which is that um, the number one version of this group of pictures um, was shown in New York City in 1923. And one critic singled it out as being an, an expression of O'Keeffe's, quote, essential feminine being, end quote. And this is part of the problem with O'Keeffe, is that we only really consider her in terms of gender. Um, the thing is, she was very much in tune to what European artists were doing, in this work particularly Kandinsky, um, because Kandinsky equated music and color. 
Um, and we've seen other artists do that as well. Whistler certainly has some of that with him as well. Um, but here we can see this is supposed to simply be this pattern of color relationships and geometric forms, but it's sort of ambivalent and it looks a lot like the close-ups of her flower pictures with which she becomes much more famous um, in the 1920s. So O'Keefe talked about this relationship between, um, well, to think about how just color can be expressive, where she said, I found that I could say things with color and shapes that I couldn't say in any other way, things that I had no words for. So this sort of shows like the harmony that exists in these color and form relationships and in nature as well. But as I said, O'Keeffe is really more famous for the works of the 1920s, where she started to explore certain subjects, including images of flowers, which she studied with very super sharp focus, very close up details in this sort of macroscopic way, which shows you she was looking at photographs and photography. The works have terribly interesting croppings. And of course, she was married at this point to Stieglitz, who was a photographer. So it shows where this might have come from, at least the sort of base of the inspiration. Um, in this case, this is one of her canonical works, but she does many of this type with these super up close images, closely cropped images of flowers. The black iris is particular, the iris in particular, um, has a long tradition in terms of Christian imagery and iconography or symbolism because those leaves um, were related to swords and so it becomes this sort of metaphor for the suffering of Christ. So here she painted it super up close. She could only get irises of this kind, these black irises from a certain New York florist for like a two week period every spring. So she saw them as something particularly special. Now, as a female painter, O'Keeffe, we treat her differently. We either talk about her in terms of her biography and for her works like this, we have tended to read these as being sort of gynecological. Um, in other words, we cannot look at her flower paintings without discussing the sexual imagery of him, that these are up close portraits of female genitalia. Uh, and it's interesting because other artists have painted irises and flowers, but they're male artists and we don't put them in this kind of box the way that we do with her. And that seems to me particularly gendered. Um, it is interesting. She talked about the idea that her flower paintings might be sexual metaphors, and she rejected that notion outright. She said this, and it's a wonderful quote. She said, nobody sees a flower really. It is so small. We haven't the time. And to see takes time, like to have a friend takes time. If I could paint the flower exactly as I see it, no one would see what I see because I would paint it small like the flower is small. So I said to myself, I'll paint what I see, what the flower is to me, but I'll paint it big and they'll be surprised into taking time to look at it. I will make even busy New Yorkers take time to see what I see of flowers. I made you take time to look at what I saw and when you took time to really notice my flower, you hung all your associations with flowers on my flower. And you write about my flower as if I think and see what you think and see of the flower. And I don't. So she refutes that idea outright. But they are interesting works. You could see the relationship between this um, and the music Pink and Blue number two, where Pink and Blue number two is supposed to be pure abstraction, but suggests organic forms like a flower. And this is supposed to be a part of a flower. And I'm showing you an actual black iris on the right, but it's treated in such an up close way that we read it as abstraction. So it's this wonderful balancing between the two. After Stieglitz and this sort of movement towards the American avant-garde, we get the very first 
real artistic movement that's born in America in the 20th century, which is precisionism. It comes about in the 1920s. It is not an organized movement of any sort, and the artists involved in it rarely show their work together. So it's not like some of the other movements we've studied, and it doesn't get its name until the 1940s. So again, like um, we've seen with other movements like Ashcan, the title comes after the fact. Essentially, pre precisionism brought together cubism, particularly synthetic cubism, and it's sort of um, geometric flat planes of color, and mixes it with um, American subject matter that was really focused on the sort of machine age. So it looks at the sort of machine's precision and its importance in modern life. It looks towards the subjects of American industry, American architecture, American cities, um, and then combines it with this very simplified, geometric, nearly abstract, stripped down, simplified forms. Um, the precisionists were very interested and influenced by um, photography, sort of sharp focused photography. Um, and basically, in this way of sort of abstracting the world around them, they're reducing what they see to simplified shapes, colors, light, and shadow. So there are two artists who we first and foremost associate with the style, which um, are Charles Sheeler and Charles Demuth, but then we'll also consider Georgia O'Keeffe in some ways and certain moments in her career amongst this group. Now, the first of these artists, Charles Sheeler, is such an interesting artist. He is Philadelphia born and trained. And interestingly, um, he studied at two different schools. First, he studied industrial drawing and applied arts at the School of Industrial Art in Philadelphia. And then he studied traditional drawing and painting at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. That right off the bat reminded me of what we talked about with Bauhaus, that Bauhaus took the sort of two art schools and combined them, the sort of industrial art school and the Fine Arts Academy. And so he really is combining this two different kinds of education. And he went to Europe twice between 1904 and 1909, where he took a real interest in medieval Italian painters. Um, if you've taken earlier art history, artists like Giotto and Masaccio, Piero della Francesca, artists who are really interested in simplified geometric forms, the sort of breaking down forms into simple, solid masses. Um, eventually, he taught himself photography, and his earliest career was working sort of freelance, taking photographs for architects of their building projects. Um, and that is something that very much relates to what we've talked about precisionism, this interest in architecture, which he focused, which he photographed in these very sort of simplified ways. He moved to New York in 1919, though. So that's right before this work was made, where he befriended Stieglitz. So he falls into the same actual modernist group that we talked about for um, 291 Gallery. Um, he was a modern art, an artist, though. He participated in the Armory Show. Um, but he he sort of works in multiple mediums. So he is a painter and he's a photographer and he's a draftsman. And he really looks and studies the interrelationship between these different media. So, for example, he very, very often uses photographs as a source for his paintings. And sometimes he'll take the same, let's say, a building and he'll make a drawing of it, a photograph of it, and a painting of it. So he'll study um, the same object in three different ways in different mediums because he's studying these objects as sort of simplified abstract designs. Now, one of the works he makes not long after he arrives in New York is this one, which is the Church Street L. So this is one of his oil paintings, and it's a view looking down from the Empire Building, which is at that point the tallest skyscraper in the financial district in New York. So he's in lower Manhattan. Um, 
you can notice a few things right away about the style. First of all, we call it precisionism, and it's got these very super sharp, clean lines. You'll notice things like the elimination of details. So for example, we don't see that many. We see some windows in the building on the left, but most of the buildings, we don't see doors, windows, brick, texture. Everything is simplified into what almost looks like an arbitrary set of patterns of light and shadow and these flat, unmodulated areas of color. Now, the view that we're looking at is a bird's eye view of Wall Street and Broadway. And you can see the Church Street L, which is the elevated train, which is what you see sort of moving up towards um, the top right corner. So that's where it gets its name, the Church Street L. That's the elevated train. In the very center, that orange shape is um, Trinity Church. And if you look at the way the picture is, photo is, I say photographed, look at the way that it's staged. You can see the shape in the bottom left-hand corner tells us that we're on a windowsill or we're looking out of a window in a skyscraper, looking down into the view below. Now, really interestingly, um, this, I already said that Scheler very often uses his photographs as models for his paintings. Um, this is actually based on a film still. So in 1920, which is the same year that he paints this picture, um, Scheler worked on a avant-garde film, probably one of the earliest American avant-garde films with the photographer Paul Strand. And it's a short film called Manhattan, which shows sort of celebrates sort of modern industrial life. It looks at skyscrapers. It's really a study of dramatic views um, and rapidly changing images of the New York City landscape. Um, and so this, as you can see on the left, that's a still shot from Manhattan. And you can see how it provided um, Scheler with the inspiration for this picture. They're very fascinating, though, to look at together. First of all, um, his use of photography in his creative process was considered somewhat controversial, even as, in his own time, because people thought he was like just copying photographs. Um, so he actually downplayed the relationship between his pictures and his photographs. His dealer asked him to do that. But you really can see it's kind of what he's exploring is the relationship here, not just between photographs and painting. And some people didn't even consider photographs fine art, so you could see the problem. But here he's bringing in the very new medium of film, and he's showing the relationship between that as well. Um, what's interesting about this is not only that he simplifies the form, creates these very precise lines. In fact, if you look up close, you can see the, how he's using a ruler to create his lines because you can see the actual bumps. You know, when you put your pencil down a ruler, you get like little, like if you have a wooden ruler and it has nicks in it or something, you get those lines. You can see those lines on his lines. You could see the lines where he moved the ruler and didn't line it up perfectly. Um, but it's got this sort of hard edged ruler like quality. You can see the way he simplified all of the forms that he's created these very bold patterns of light and color. And then you can also see what he's changed from it. Um, you know, unlike the ash can artists who are who wanted to be on ground level with the buildings and study the grit and realism and the people of the city. Remember, they'd rather paint the people who built the skyscraper than the skyscraper. This sort of operates as an opposite view of the city because, you know, Sheila's sort of ambivalent to the grit and the noise and the movement of the city. And, in, and maybe that's just because it's 1920 and the city had become so much more of an institution. Most people in America at this point lived in cities compared to the rural populations. But you can also see that he's removed all the people from the landscape, which are present in the film. We see people waiting for trains and walking down streets and all of that is removed. So there's also this tremendous sense of isolation, 
and loneliness and solitude in the city for Sheila. Now this is where you can see that O'Keeffe fits into precisionism as well, because during the 1920s, she made a series of images, maybe about 20 plus scenes of New York City between 1925 and 1930, and they are her most overtly sort of representational images because they really are views of the city. And they were often made from the window of her apartment. So this fits into that precisionist mode, first of all, because it is this view of the city with all of the forms reduced to these incredibly flat planes, devoid of texture, with the interest in just geometry, colors, and light and shade. So it has a lot in common with the work of Scheler. Um, she talks about the city, O'Keeffe, because she struggled a lot and she ended up eventually splitting half her time between the city and New Mexico before she ultimately moved to New Mexico permanently in 1946. But she says, you have to live in today. Today, the city is something bigger, more complex than ever before in history, and nothing can be gained from running away. I couldn't even if I could. Um, so again, it's this looking at the city and the skyscrapers and the skyscrapers become this symbol of modernity and ingenuity. It's not a social critique. It's about the beauty of the form. And so here she exaggerates it with this very sort of tall, slender, vertical canvas. And it's from this, instead of the bird's eye view looking down like Sheeler, she's made small by the buildings and looking up. And the buildings dwarf everything, including the moon, which is way down towards the bottom of the picture. So we see this dichotomy, this relationship being spelled out between the buildings and sort of the natural world, where the natural world is small and low compared to these monolithic forms up above. And we can see the curving forms, these rounded forms of the moon compared to the very straight precisionist lines that we see in the skyscrapers above. The last of the precisionist artists that we'll look at is Charles de Muth, though I've heard that he called himself um, his last name with the accent on the first syllable, like Charles de Muth, and so they called him Deem. Um, he was from a wealthy family in Pennsylvania, so he didn't really have to work for a living, but he did complete his studies at the Pennsylvania Academy in 1910. So he went through the same sort of formal education and he eventually comes across Marsden Hartley in 1912, I think, I'm sorry, when he was on a trip to Paris and Hartley ends up becoming a sort of mentor to DeMuth. Um, he worked in multiple media, like some of the artists that we've seen. So he worked with book illustrations. He was absolutely a watercolorist artist. Um, and he was a painter as well. Um, in terms of being a watercolorist, it was quite funny because we saw Marin as a primary watercolorist out of the Stieglitz camp. Um, and, and Demuth knew Marin, they all know each other. It's a sort of insular group. And so of Marin, Demuth said this, he brought his, he's talking about watercolor, he brought his up in buckets and spilled much along the ray. I dipped mine out with a teaspoon, but I never spilled a drop. So you get this sense of his like extreme precision and care with his use of his medium as opposed to the much more expressive, thick, gestural use of the medium that we saw with Marin. And you can see that here in his uh, 1927 work, My Egypt, which seems like a very unusual title. Um, right off the bat, you're going to see um, a relationship with art movements that we've looked at so far. So absolutely the relationship to synthetic cubism, but now also to futurism because we've got these, what we might call lines of force, these diagonal lines that cut across the picture that suggest almost like movement or the passage of time. But the picture itself is an image of the John W. 
Eshelman and Sons grain elevators. So this was a sort of common scene. Um, this was part of his views of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where he's from. Um, so it's a grain elevator, but it is something that he is painting in a very sort of serious way and giving it the title of My Egypt. So what do we make of that title? Um, certainly, um, it's Egypt had a certain cachet at the point, at the time. Um, in 1922 is when Howard Carter discovered and opened up the tomb of Tutankhamun. So Egypt had a certain meaning at that time. But you know, you can also look maybe at the formal relationship, the physical similarities between the grain elevator and the Egyptian pyramid. Um, and we can also look at just sort of the cultural associations that the grain elevators became sort of a symbol of American industry, uh, you know, American grain that is comparable to the sort of here it's made comparable to the culture of ancient Egypt. Um, you know, in other words, it's as sort of important to its culture as the pyramids would be to the other one. There are some, you know, built in critiques there as well in that um, the pyramids were built by slaves. And so this certainly says something about the history of labor in America um, and even that modern industry, even after slavery, was seen as being very sort of exploitative of workers. Um, we can also relate this work to his own personal situation. Um, and we know that DeMuth spends most of his life in poor health. Um, he suffered from diabetes, and that's eventually what killed him, complications from diabetes at the age of 51. But for large period, periods of time, it also made it so that he couldn't really travel. And so this kind of picture, you know, that relates to imprisonment, you know, the imprisonment um, of the Jews, by, you know, if you talk about my Egypt, it's got all of these sort of connotations, to, it's a biblical connotations to it. Um, and so it's almost like he's looking at the world around him and Lancaster as a place of imprisonment, just like um, Egypt was to the Jews. Um, so so that that is another way of maybe looking at this work and seeing the way that he transposes the images and the imagery onto something else. But the style is exactly that of the precisionists. Very clean lines, sharp edges, minimal detail, where everything just becomes an abstract pattern of color and light. DeMuth's most famous picture, however, is this work, which is actually in the Metropolitan Museum, called I Saw the Figure Five in Gold. And this is interesting because it's something we've talked about more than once today, which is the idea of the abstract portrait. So this work certainly fits into precisionist painting. We can see the interest in um, sort of a synthetic cubism model, we can see forms sort of simplified and flattened into bright areas of color. Um, and we can see these very sort of clear, sharp edges that we associate with precisionism. Um, DeMuth had become interested in advertising and billboards and sort of this modern graphic language, and that makes its way into his work. And he saw things like billboards and posters not as sort of a blemish, um, on the natural world, but rather, you know, that these things had their own kinds of abstract beauty. So this work was actually part of a series of eight pictures that DeMuth did in the 1920s, which were called his poster portraits. And they were actually these um, paintings that were comprised of text and image together that were associated with his friends. And here you can actually see that two of the other poster portraits he did in 1924 
were actually of two artists we've seen today. So it shows you how sort of tight knit these circles are. So on the left, you can see his poster portrait of Georgia O'Keeffe. And in the middle, you can see his poster portrait of um, Arthur Dove. So the work that we're looking at is the one on the right. And again, like a lot of modern painters, um, DeMuth is looking for very sort of modern American subjects. And in this case, the modern American subject is a portrait of his friend who was a poet and a physician, a man named William Carlos William. And he based the picture on a particular poem. And it was a poem called The Great Figure by Williams. It's a one sentence poem. It just goes like this. Among the rain and the lights, I saw the figure five in gold on a red fire truck, moving, tense, unheeded, to gong clangs, siren howls, and wheels rumbling through the dark city. The painting has all sorts of references to William Carlos Williams. So we see it in the very bottom of the frame, the bottom edge of the picture in the center says WCW, which are his initials. And on the left hand side at the same level, we see Charles DeMuth's. So you see the parallel between them. At the very top of the work, we see his nickname, Bill. But that's also a little bit of a joke because, um, you know, the bill is up where you would have a bill board. And bills were names for things like an advertising, a poster, an ad. So it's a little bit of a pun. Um, we see his middle name here as well, Carlos, but the S is cut off. It's painted in little dots as if it's um, theaters, like a theater sign, like those are made up out of light bulbs. So he's turned into a Broadway star. Um, the other text we see on the right hand side seems to say art company. Um, which might be what is suggested here. So that might be a reference to the sort of commercial project um, of artists at the time. And then in the center, we see what is the fire truck. So it's a really dynamic picture and we see those diagonal sort of motion lines that we saw in other artists from Futurism and in Scheler. Um, these sort of force lines. And here they suggest both movement and sound as it appears that a fire truck advances towards us. So I suppose it could go away depending on where the number on the truck was. We find ourselves in the picture on this sort of dark city alley and the buildings and the street, everything is gray. Right, you can see the perspectival view of the city with its those round lights marking the edge of the road, the street lamps. Um, and then we see the red fire truck in the middle of the scene, probably moving away from us. So we see the five get smaller and smaller. Um, we can make out the ladder on the right hand side and at the bottom what appears to be an axle. And these forms on either side should either represent wheels or represent the sirens. And you could see these sort of diagonally curving lines which could represent then the sound of the fire truck moving or the speed of the fire truck. So this is very much in keeping, this is a wonderful picture because it's in keeping with what we've learned about the precisionists and how they're looking at cubism but they're interested in these very clean lines and their urban modern sort of life um, we see the precisionist artists pick up on this. You know, again, it's the abandoned city that we see um, in Scheler's pictures. Um, but we can also relate this to the sort of abstract portraits that we've looked at in this class, both by Dove and by Hartley. So it fits into that. And here it's even a richer combination of text and image because it not only um, is a sort of abstract portrait of William Carlos Williams, but it is based very much on telling the story from the text of the poem.
And that's as far as we're going to get today. But I hope that gives you at least some picture of how sort of the avant-garde that we saw already happening in Europe made its way to America and how we get the birth of real American movements just after the turn of the 20th century.